Welcome to the POC Gamer Lore Diver podcast series, where every week or so I dive into the lore of some of the most popular game worlds and tabletop role playing. Remember to follow this podcast and you can support POC Gamer directly through Coffee and Patreon. This week, an introduction to the arcane age of the Forgotten Realms. And before we start, as usual with any D&D lore, unless it specifically appears in a 5th edition gamebook, nothing is canon unless you want it to be. Background. So, prior to the events last year with Wizards of the Coast, I had started a video and website article series about the near-mythical arcane age of the Forgotten Realms. The series is relaunching here with this episode. The arcane age itself finds its origins in the first edition of AD&D, in the original Forgotten Realms box set way back in 1987. A key thing to remember at this point is that the AD&D Forgotten Realms was a very different animal from what it would become, feeling much bleaker and bordering on post-apocalyptic at times, and the few mentions of Netheril in this box set reflect that. And I do mean just a few mentions. I believe I only found it twice when I did a uh, word search and a PDF document for it. It was pretty brutal. But the idea was planted and would bloom in the second edition of AD&D, particularly in the appropriately named Arcane Age series, followed by some underrated and underappreciated love in 3rd edition's Lost Empires of Faron book. 4th edition added some spice to the era, but made no major moves, and in 5th edition we know Netheril was a thing, but not much else. We're not sure exactly how much canon has moved forward or what is canon, although we do know that the Anorak Desert, which I will cover in a later episode, is a thing again, unfortunately. But what is the Arcane Age? That's a very reasonable question, and it is not an easy one to answer. Per the books, as far as I can tell, the Arcane Age is a nebulously dated period roughly occurring between the founding of Netheril in minus 3,859 Dale Reckoning and the fall of Myth Draenor and Cormanthir in 714 Dale Reckoning. However, taking a broader view of it to include other magical civilizations that weren't Netheril, things start to change. One of the challenges of the Arcane Age is that it was created with very little attention to the connective tissue of the world, meaning that it was primarily focused on Nethril and Cormanthir, with some attention paid to their often short-lived successor states, and even less attention to their contemporaries. So for the purposes of this episode, and future ones about the Arcane Age, because I'm not letting all that research I did last year go to waste, I'm treating Minus 8,000 Dale Reckoning as the start of the Arcane Age. It's a nice round number, and close enough to the establishment of the first notable human civilization on Faron, Imaskar, the Rauran Empire, that I'm comfortable with that date. And I'm terminating it in minus 339 Dale Reckoning, the year that Karsus's folly would rob the world of free magic and spells 10th level and above. Just in shorthand, the primary characteristics of the Arcane Age can be found in its genres, which are an interesting but very functional blend of a very true high fantasy setting mixed with a very gritty sword and sorcery one, uh, which very accurately uh, reflects the dichotomy of the time. However, magic in this era was functionally unlimited. The goddess Mistral made the weave open to all, meaning that even the lowest commoner could, based on their intelligence, permanently learn simple spells and use them a limited number of times per day. This is outstanding. Um, They're called cantras, I believe, in uh, the Nethril book. These are the equivalents of cantrips, and they're learned permanently, and you can cast them X amount of times per day. It's almost like a sorcerer deal. It's very cool. And it's also an era when there was no requirement for ingredients for many spells that you could simply cast them. Ingredients were considered an extra or something you needed to use for incredibly powerful spells that were very complex. But like throwing a fireball, yeah, if you have that spell, you just cast it. There were no spell level limits with 10 11th and even 12th level magic being available or better described being available to be developed there wasn't a lot of actual 10th 10th and 11th level magic and i believe only three 12th level magic spells but that's just my opinion there's only one formerly canonical 12th level spell but I'll get into more of that in a later episode. And there was a plurality of magic that really fueled all the mighty empires of the age. They weren't all the same, which I think was very cool. The following are just some of the notable nations that were there and active during this huge length of time. Right away, we have Imaskar, the Rauran Empire. Uh, This is out in Farron's eastern areas. They mastered the art of dimensional portals and folding space. They had near instantaneous traversal of their empire and what can only be described as TARDIS-like cities and fortresses. A whole lot of bigger on the inside than appearing on the outside. 
outside action happening there. And they were so powerful they could reach into other dimensions and steal people to be slaves from them, which is a staggering amount of power. Down to the south, you have the Kalim Empire, the forerunner of modern Kalimshan, which was established by a jinn traveling from a pre-enlightenment Zakara, along with their human Janazi and halfling slaves, and they rapidly drove out both dragons and giants before enslaving the humans in what is now Kalimshan. Their magic was, unsurprisingly, elemental in nature. To the north, you have the giant kingdom Astoria, and its citizens are ruled by the Divine Ordining, a directive from their pantheon's head god as to how things have to be and who does what. Their strength and magic is sufficient they once fought a war with dragons and remained powerful enough as a nation, even after being reduced to half its size, that Nethril declined to try to fight them despite the fact that they were like right next door. Sandwiched between the giant kingdom of Austeria to the north, Emiscar to the southeast, and Nethril to the west and northwest is an honest outsider civilization, the Jamdath Psyocracy. Ruling from their sword cities in what's now the Vilhan Reach, they eschewed magic in favor of powerful psionic abilities that were of equal strength and had like their own little micro-empire for the longest time. Uh, to the far south, you have the god of Tao bringing human tribes over from Katashaka to wage war for him and his preserve of Chult against the deadly descendants of the Sirak, the yuan and their minions who are in the next-door nation of the Marshal. Magic, divine, and arcane just lit up the jungles as they battled in what was functionally an unending war for thousands of years. And way across the trackless sea in the lands now known as Mazdka, there was a mighty magical nation that left only intensely magical ruins, strange golems, and signs of an apparent mass departure into space, I think? Like, possibly, like, some sort of spell jamming thing? I don't know. It was wild. And that's just a taste of the air. This isn't even touching into the elves, dwarves, or other major nation builders that were at work at the same time. And and after all, like there were still very real and very powerful elven nations lying around after the catastrophic and now historically muddled crown wars. Uh, that's a different episode, though. And there's so many dwarven kingdoms, like just so many. Now, I'll be covering all these areas in more detail in future episodes, but this is just a good starting point to give a taste of what this era is all about and how much larger it is than Nethril and Nethril's immediate environs. There's so much more going on in this planet that just was not connected up properly. Ideas. Full disclosure, this is, in my opinion, the best era of the Forgotten Realms. It's not perfect. It still has a lot of issues, but as a setting concept, outstanding. It has the rare capacity to support both TSR and Wizards editions of Dungeons and & Dragons, and there are very few settings that can do that. In fact, none that I, I can think of off the top of my head can go back and forth as easily as this one can. And not only that, it actually makes the powers, abilities, and greater prevalence of magic that you find in 3rd, 4th, and 5th edition classes, subclasses, and prestige classes make sense, because that magic is more available. It's something that can be developed. It's something that can be gained without having to go through the traditional paths of becoming a wizard, or in this case, an arcanist. And if you drop the game into, like, the minus 2809 to minus 2488 Dale Reckoning period, you get pretty much all the major powers at once. Like, all the ones that I mentioned uh, a moment ago are all present. And if you go from the minus 2488 to minus 339 Dale Reckoning period, this is a beautiful denouement. It's empires are tearing themselves apart, new ones are rising, adventures abound, there's all sorts of strife and conflict and all sorts, like, all that good stuff. That stuff that a lot of people look for when they're trying to think of what to do for adventures or design. All happening in that beautiful period. Now the biggest idea for me, especially in this era is to put that missing connective tissue between the various powers. For example, was Nethril the most powerful? Were they really that powerful? Because they never went to war against a peer or near-peer adversary. All of their major conflicts were either internal or against barbarian hordes in what was some really less than stellar writing and world-building choices that they made. So they never actually went to war against anyone as powerful as them. And the other powers are just that, they're powers. Magic is going to affect the battlefield. So there's questions like that. And it's also a remarkably diverse era with various European, Sumerian, Norse, Hellenic, and multiple African, and like I mean African, as in like Northeast and at least West Africa represented, coded humans and civilizations. And this is something I would expand on and grow because that's the sort of diversity the modern Forgotten Realms is often missing. Parts are there, but they're not emphasized on, and this would be a chance to 
do that. It's also a relatively unprecedented era in terms of integration for non-human civilizations. Elves are only partway into their retreat, and the whole place is clearly not into the whole rise of humanity thing yet. So the world is more diverse, not just in the terms of like human diversity, but there are more non-human empires, nations, kingdoms, and so on that are actually important. They're not just little footnotes on a map. And speaking of maps, there is a huge amount of dungeon ruin crawling to do. In terms of adventures and so on, there's just there's so many ruins of like the Elven Empires that are fresh. There's remnants from the Days of Thunder that are still active. There's just so much going on that it's amazing. You can do so much with it so easily without having to like dig too deep into a lot of stuff. Now, this final point is going to be controversial, especially for anybody who knows my opinions about 4th edition and what it did to Forgotten Realms, and it's a pretty big step, but hear me out. I think that the things that happened to the Forgotten Realms in terms of damage to the continent and changes to the continental map as seen in 4th edition is a better post Karsis event than what actually happened. Because what actually happened was pretty basic. Magic turned off and turned back on again. Some cities fell, some didn't. Karsis got turned into a statue that cried blood. Magic got cut off. That's boring. So, so very boring. And I'm not even kidding. This map reflects the divine punishment that Zach would have drawn much better. It gives the beautiful map that created a new life and effectively creates an alternate high fantasy Forgotten Realms setting that bypasses so much of the issues that occurred with what happened in 4th uh, edition. Now I'll be coming back to this in a future episode because I think the idea has merit and would provide a world that with some polish would match Eberron in terms of actually fitting the mechanics and concepts in Dungeons and Dragons. And for people who've been following me for a while, they'll know that this is not something that I say lightly. This is an idea that when it hit me was a little bit stunning, uh, more than a bit surprising, but the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. So I will absolutely be coming back to it. This has been an introduction to the arcane age of the Forgotten Realms. Thank you very much for listening. If you still are, I hope you enjoyed this week's content. Don't forget to check out the PSC Gamer website, follow PSC Gamer on social media, and I need to send out a huge thank you to my Patreon and coffee supporters who have made this all possible.